When I returned home to my beloved wife, I was confronted with a shocking sight. She was lying in bed with her lover, who also turned out to be her boss. At first, I decided to kick them out, but the situation changed for the worse when her lover started humiliating and provoking me. Overcome with anger, I decided to take revenge. I am currently in a prison cell and cannot agree to any persuasion to mitigate the charges of assault and battery. I shared my story with my parents in the hope of shedding light on how I ended up in this situation. If I had taken advantage of these offers, I could have avoided jail time, mandatory community service, and possibly saved my marriage. But after this incident, my marriage is no longer a priority, but at least my freedom would have been preserved. My name is Ron Jacobs, I'm 29 years old, and I worked at a construction site before I was imprisoned. I was once happily married to Carly, who was also 29, and considered her my partner for life. When I say, was married, I mean exactly that. We are currently in the process of divorce. Carly, who worked as a secretary for one of the partners in a law firm, may still hold this position, as far as I know. It is clear where everything is going. Some people in positions of power often take a mistress at home to raise the status of their family, and any woman under the age of 50 is considered a potential target. Faced with the need to use their influence, these people do not shy away. They know how to manipulate the legal system to their advantage and often have the financial resources to achieve the desired result. One example of such a person is Randolph Wiseman, his father started a business, and Randy enjoyed his success until he made some serious mistakes. I must admit that I quite understand why he was attracted to women. Randolph was tall, powerfully built, with a perpetually tanned complexion. He was just under 40 years old, and, as my wife repeatedly pointed out, he was very attractive. I was never bothered by her compliments as I also recognized the attractiveness of our friends and even the random women we crossed paths with. We were open and honest with each other, realizing that in a world of almost 8 billion people, it's just human nature to find others attractive. Carly has never given me any reason to doubt her loyalty. I used to think that we were inseparable and completely devoted to each other. But now, although she claims that nothing has changed, it is difficult for me to understand her position after what happened recently. Although being in prison gave me the opportunity to decide who to talk to, I have cut off communication with Carly since my arrest, despite attempts on her part, from our lawyers, our families, and our caring friends. I've made it clear to all concerned. I'll mention Carly again, and all communication between us will be cut off. After being pressured by several friends and Carly's sister, I decided to isolate myself from them and refused to communicate with them. My lawyer, realizing that he was on thin ice, did not want to miss the chance to cash in on my upcoming divorce. Being a mercantile lawyer, he saw a chance to get a large sum of money. Despite the fact that I was facing a 10-year sentence for aggravated assault and grievous bodily harm, I ended up getting a two-year sentence. I was lucky to have the judge who handled my case and I thought his personal experience might have influenced his decision. I guessed that his wife was unfaithful to him. Throughout the trial and sentencing, he admitted that I was subjected to extreme provocations from my wife and her lover, as well as the disrespectful behavior of the latter. But at the same time, he pointed out that some of the injuries were not the result of self-defense, and some of them deserve a long prison sentence. He suggested that I could spare the state from a trial if I agreed to a plea bargain offered by the district attorney. I have now been serving my sentence for eight months, and I hope that with good behavior I will be released in 12 months, especially considering my clean record before this incident. When I am released, I intend to take revenge and inflict suffering on those who have harmed me, regardless of the consequences, even if it means going back to prison. They'll all get what they deserve, especially that disgusting bastard. Simply put, this is what I wrote to my parents. Dear parents, I regret the shame that I caused you by my actions in prison. It was never my intention to bring shame on you. I was faced with a choice. Either face the consequences 
live with the guilt of what I had experienced, or take a plea bargain to avoid going to prison. I hope you understand why I couldn't live with this feeling. My love for Carly was deep and sincere, and I sincerely believed that our relationship was destined to last. But I was wrong in my judgments about her character. I never suspected her connection to Wiseman, even if she casually mentioned his good looks. But what does it matter? After all, many people are attractive. One day, the course of my life changed dramatically when we finished a significant redevelopment of the house in the morning, had a drink with the crew at lunch, and went about our business. When I returned to my house, I was greeted by a BMW parked in the driveway, and Carly's car was nowhere to be found. This immediately caused concern, because I had never doubted her loyalty before. It was obvious that someone had brought her home in an expensive car. As soon as I entered our quiet house, my attention was attracted by sounds coming from above, and I headed to our bedroom. I found my wife with her boss, and it was truly heartbreaking. While they were unaware of my presence, her boss shamelessly made remarks that he was a real man compared to me. At that moment, I felt a wave of anger wash over me, and for a moment I was paralyzed. Despite his appearance, I knew that his real strength lay in hard work, which he, with his toned physique, would never be able to understand. Without thinking, I grabbed him tightly by the hair, pulled him away from her and pressed him against the wall. I glanced at Carly, who looked shocked by the situation. I firmly told her to pack her things and get out. Randolph waved me off and tried to pretend to be cool. So you think you're cool, he chuckled. But before he could finish his sentence, I hit him in the face with all my might, which made him stagger. I warned him that he was not welcome in my house and that he should try his luck elsewhere. I warned him that if he stayed, he would regret it very much. Wiseman foolishly decided to ignore my words and tried to take a swing at me. Without thinking, I grabbed his wrist and quickly twisted it behind his back. I warned him again. He started shouting that if I even laid a finger on him, he would make sure that I spent a significant amount of time locked up and would stay with Carly while I was gone, and he added that I was a pathetic excuse for a man. His smug grin quickly disappeared as I continued to press, causing a sickening crunch to resound through the room. I knocked him to the floor. When he screamed in pain, Carly rushed to me, begging, Stop it, Ron! He can arrest you if you keep doing this! Please stop! Are you more worried about your boyfriend, Carly? I snapped back. No, Ron, I'm worried about you. I don't want you to ruin your life because of him and me. I was a fool, she admitted. I looked at her and said coldly, It's none of your business anymore. She tried to come up to me. I was overwhelmed with emotions, and eventually I spat in her face, which I now regret very much. Despite my actions, it didn't stop her. I shouted at her to pack her things and leave, considering her a disgraceful person whom I no longer want to meet. To my surprise, she obeyed, and gathering her things, began to sob. Turning to Wiseman, I added, Your actions don't match your name. You're a jerk. A person with intelligence would never intentionally incite people like me, especially using disrespectful expressions like peeping, unless they are looking for trouble, as you are now. Pay attention. As soon as this woman finishes packing, you two will leave. I recommend that she take you to the emergency room to ease your suffering. Don't come back here anymore. This house passed to me from my grandfather even before we tied the knot. She doesn't have any rights to him, so don't try. If you do, I won't hesitate to take more serious measures next time. If you don't want to end up in a hospital bed or in a wheelchair, stay away from me. It's your responsibility now. Either bring her home to meet your family or get rid of her. I don't care. Behind me, Carly let out a desperate moan, but I stood my ground. Carly, I'm far from perfect and I'll never forget what you did. You're an insidious liar. Maybe you should have been more careful and booked a hotel room. Then maybe I wouldn't have found out the truth. I hit him hard on the sensitive area. Was this your devious plan? Do it in my bed. Another blow followed, causing him to cry out in horror. Remember, 
If you give me even the slightest reason in the future, I will completely ruin your life. Dear Mom and Dad, I decided to explain to you how everything went wrong between Carly and me. I know I was harsh, but I hope you can understand my point of view. I am in the process of divorcing her, and as soon as it is completed, I will be free from this toxic relationship. I have no intention of looking back or even acknowledging its existence. My last memory of her will be an insulting act. I spat in her face, which unfortunately seemed justified at that moment. I appreciate your support during this difficult time, but I must admit that I have lost faith in the institution of marriage. I can't imagine ever being able to trust another woman the way I trusted Carly. It pains me to say this, but she betrayed that trust in a way I could never have imagined. I'm sorry, Mom. But I didn't hesitate to trust Carly, and now I see the consequences of this decision. That night led to my arrest and the beginning of all this chaos. Wiseman did his best to get me behind bars, provided the sheriff's office with detailed reports on my injuries, and enlisted the help of a friend in the district attorney's office to bring charges against me. Among those charges was aggravated assault, a crime for which I could have been jailed for up to ten years. He managed to convince Carly to press charges against me for spitting in her face. After my arrest, the trial began. It turned out that Carly decided to drop the assault charge against me, considering it insignificant. With the help of a lawyer, I received a plea offer from the district attorney. The deal included a plea of guilty to misdemeanor assault, a six-month suspended sentence, and payment of Wiseman's medical bills. This offer was conditional on two conditions. First, Wiseman demanded that I sign an agreement in which I promised to keep secret the information that I had recently shared with my wife about the attack. Secondly, I was asked to postpone my divorce from Carly until we complete a marriage counseling course. These conditions seemed to them to be a way to find an easy way out of the situation, but I did not want to agree. Instead, I decided to turn down the offer and stand trial. Despite the fact that my lawyer regarded this proposal as positive, since it was possible to avoid imprisonment, he also warned me that if the trial did not go in my favor, then I would face a long term of imprisonment, up to 10 years. I began to doubt that he really understood the gravity of the situation, the traumatic events that had occurred in my own home, and that Wiseman had shown me such disrespect. Despite the possible consequences, I was determined to take revenge at any cost. I wasn't afraid of going to jail. I felt prepared and confident in my ability to cope with life behind bars. I was sure that when I was released, I would be able to find a job in construction, despite my criminal record. I was determined to fight for justice and not let anyone disrupt my life. I didn't want to reconcile with Carly. She disappeared from my life forever. As the days passed, I was informed that a visitor had come to see me. Since the relatives had already come a few days ago, I thought it was them again. But when they brought me into the room, Carly was there, and I quickly called the guards. They came to see what was going on, and I strongly demanded that they no longer let this woman come to me. She tried to say that she was my wife, but they escorted her out, saying that I had the right not to let visitors in. I turned to a lawyer for advice and started the divorce process. I asked my lawyer about the possibility of litigation with Carly's employer and her boss, Wiseman. He informed me that although attachment alienation lawsuits are allowed in our state, none of them have been successful in two decades. At the same time, he mentioned that the company may prefer to settle the case out of court in order to avoid public outcry, and we could emphasize their lack of moral values. I also asked about the consequences of resolving a legal dispute before or after our divorce. He gave a direct answer. He suggested waiting until the divorce to reduce the estate before coming to an agreement. Our house is safe, but she will get half of the rest of the property. I will resolve this issue with them after the divorce. If you happen to talk to her, please don't discuss any of this with her. I know that you both loved her but I believe that you will not disappoint me. Mom and Dad, I appreciate both of you, and this situation is temporary. I hope they now understand the whole story.
not just the one that Carly and a few friends told me who thought I should forgive her. Before I was released, there was a hitch in the divorce process. Carly demanded that certain conditions be met. I had to either agree to consultations, as she had suggested earlier, or allow her three-hour visits during which we had to talk. She knew that I could easily brush her off during these visits. Despite my strong desire to end the divorce, I decided that three short consultations were better than the initial court requirement. I briefly thought about giving up both options, serving my time, and then disappearing. But I was determined not to let her kick me out of the house, especially since my parents were approaching retirement and wanted me, their only son, in their lives while they were getting old. The very thought of being in her presence made my skin crawl, but against my better judgment, I agreed to her offer of three visits. I reassured myself that if the situation became too unbearable, I could always ask for help to get her kicked out. During my first visit, Carly greeted me with a casual, Hi Ron, you look good considering everything that's going on. I couldn't contain my anger and replied, Go to hell, Carly. It's your fault that you couldn't control yourself and slept with your boss. Say what you need to say and then get out. Carly's attempt to bring me to tears only disgusted me. I no longer cared about her emotions. I just despised her, realizing that hate is not the opposite of love, but rather a love that has been destroyed beyond recognition. I have not yet reached the point of mature indifference when thoughts about my ex-partner cease to matter. I aim to achieve this state of complete indifference in the near future. Ron, I'm stunned by the damage I've done to you in our relationship. Carly, you're not the only one who looks at things that way. Ron, could you just listen to me without resorting to insults? I can hear you, Carly, but I'm not interested in listening to what you have to say. You cheated on me in our own house, in our bed, with a man who disrespected and shamed me by being with you. How can you expect me to forgive, forget, or even tolerate your involvement in my life? Carly's face turned pale, and tears rolled down her cheeks. That's why I wanted to have three meetings. I'm not feeling very well today, but I'll be back. My love for you is unshakable, despite your thoughts. I admit my mistake but my feelings for you are unchanged. Carly, I agree to these three meetings, but please know that I hold a deep grudge against you for hurting us. I despise not only your actions, but also you. Reconciliation is not an option for me. After these meetings, I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. She stood in silence and knocked softly on the door, asking for permission to leave. A week later, another guest appeared on the doorstep, my mother. Despite all my warnings, I decided that she had come to talk to me about Carly. Ron, I know you're hesitant to bring this up, she began. I understand that this may negatively affect our relationship, but please let me express my point of view. I conceded, giving her the opportunity to speak out. You have a special place in my heart, but this is just a one-time request, okay, Mom? I need to cut her out of my life. No matter what you say, nothing will change. I'm going to love you anyway. Thank you, son. And I love you more than anyone except your father. I understand that what she did to you cannot be forgiven. But I want to discuss this for your sake, not for her sake. I don't expect you to forgive her or give her another chance. She doesn't deserve it. You deserve a spouse you can trust. But Ron, what I'm going to say is for your own good. It may seem to you that you despise her at the moment, and it is quite possible that this is the case. But until you let go of all this hate, you won't find peace in your life. I'm just asking you to talk to her without aggression, without verbal attacks. Just last week, she came up to me looking for a conversation, Ron. She is deeply traumatized, completely broken. She worries that she became a victim of manipulation by this insidious man and eventually betrayed you. She admits that she has lost you and understands the seriousness of your words spoken during the previous visit. The pain you caused her was as deep as you wanted it to be. If your goal is to break it, you've achieved it. I'm just asking you to listen to her without demanding that you change your mind. I understand that you won't do it and neither will she. 
Even if it seems that there is no chance to fix everything, please let her leave with dignity, out of respect for those happy moments that you once spent together. It is on the verge of collapse. Imagine how you will feel ten years from now if you find out that your words pushed her to the decision to harm herself. Mom, I can be indifferent and say that I don't care what's going on with her right now, but you're right. Over time, the anger will decrease, making room for remorse in the current situation. I wouldn't want to live with the guilt of her actions. Thanks for the wise words, Mom. I will stop trying to make her life miserable. I really loved her with all my heart, but it seems that divorce is the only way out. I will be released from prison soon, and I am determined to remain free forever. I am grateful to you and Dad for the constant love and support. I couldn't have asked for better parents. Thank you, Mom, for helping me come to this decision. I know it's the right choice for me, even if it might not be the best one for Carly. A few days later, Carly came to me. This time, I started the conversation first. Carly, I want to apologize for my previous behavior. Looking back, I realized that my words were harsh and devoid of the courtesy you deserve. After talking to my mom, I realized how important it is to be kind, especially after the good times we spent together before everything turned upside down. Thanks, Ron. And thank you so much to your mom for her support, even though I didn't ask for it. Deep down, I understand that I may not have another chance with you, but I feel the need to express remorse for my actions. You really are the best person I've ever known, and will know. To be completely honest, perhaps we can do without a third meeting. I don't want to upset you anymore, but I think it's necessary to sort out the situation. I behaved like a child, even though I am almost 30 years old. I allowed myself to be influenced by an adult man who seemed sophisticated and showered me with attention, which led to the betrayal of the person I truly love. Now I realize how stupid I was, Ron. I made a mistake that I deeply regret. He used a small amount of money and compliments about my appearance to manipulate me, and I bought into it. I was stupid and naive, allowing myself to succumb to superficial flattery. Most of all, I regret letting him get into our bed more than any other part of my betrayal. I have no excuses for my actions, and I understand the seriousness of my mistake. His desire to take part in the forbidden act of being with a married woman in her husband's bed forced me to make a deplorable decision that caused deep disrespect for you. I'm truly sorry, Ron. Now I understand that you have the right to seek a divorce. My actions reflect a lack of self-esteem, and if I can't respect myself, how can I expect you to love me as much as you once did? I still hope to save our marriage, but now I realize that this is impossible. My heart is broken because you are the only one I have ever truly loved. I am ready to sign all the necessary papers for our divorce as soon as possible. You deserve someone better than me, Ron. You are a wonderful person and you will be a wonderful father. I've always dreamed of starting a family with you and growing old together. If there's anything I can ask of you, it's one thing. Please don't let my mistakes get in the way of your future. You deserve to be with a woman who will make you happy and help you build a wonderful life together. May your family be proud of you and cherish each other. I would like to be that kind of woman for you, but I don't have the courage to fix everything. Maybe one day you'll remember our time with love instead of dwelling on how I let you down. I've said my word. Now it's time for me to leave. I want you to know that I've made mistakes that have affected my own life, but I'm asking you not to let my actions ruin yours. My love for you will always be there. Goodbye, Ron. Despite everything that had happened, I was deeply moved. I told her, My Carly, you're right. We can't rebuild our relationship. Everything is clear to me now. I will never be able to regain the trust I once had in you. But today you reminded me of a woman I once cherished. Carly, I want you to know that even though I can't love you again without trust, I no longer feel enmity towards you. I hope you find your happiness, Carly. A mistake doesn't make you bad, it's just that you're not right for me. Goodbye, Carly. We exchanged a brief hug before she left. 
It was obvious that it was not easy for her to say these words. She admitted her flaws and stupidities, but nothing she said could change my decision to end our marriage. Carly agreed to sign the papers without requiring a new meeting. Having fulfilled her promise, she signed the divorce papers, marking the beginning of our divorce pending a final decision. Shortly after Carly and I broke up for the last time, I received confirmation of the date of my release from prison. After my release, my parents came to pick me up. All the time I spent in prison, I followed the law relentlessly and was determined to make life difficult for Randolph Wiseman. The day after my release, I sat down with my lawyer to discuss our plans to restore justice to Wiseman. Even though I spent a year in prison for my actions against him, I still felt that his punishment was insufficient. When I found him in my bed with Carly, he threatened me with imprisonment, as a result of which I inflicted several bodily injuries on him. Was it worth a year of my life in prison? I do not think so. He got only a small part of what he deserved. Now I was determined to turn his life into a spiral. My lawyer and I have developed a strategy to hold Wiseman accountable. Our initial plan was to contact his firm and inform them of our intention to sue for negligence in order to prevent any future relationship between his employees. We assumed that they would most likely reject our request, citing the lack of similar cases investigated in the state over the past two decades. As a next step, we plan to launch a media campaign to promote our cause. The story looks like this. The husband, feeling insulted, publicly talks about how he found his wife with the boss in their house. He tells how Wiseman humiliated him until he had to physically expel this lawyer from his territory. Subsequently, the husband was arrested on charges of an associate of Wiseman, the district attorney, and spent a year in prison for assault. In addition, Wiseman's actions played a significant role in the ongoing divorce proceedings. Thanks to my lawyer's connections with a journalist who had a grudge against Wiseman, our strategy bore fruit. The story got into the newspapers and attracted the attention of the national press. We assumed that Wiseman's associates would want to avoid a scandal and would prefer to settle the case out of court. My ultimate goal was to destroy Wiseman's marriage, just as he destroyed mine. I decided to postpone my revenge until I had settled matters with the law firm. Our expectations regarding the result turned out to be absolutely correct. Although the company rejected our claims, they hinted that we had to be wealthy to sue and confidently stated that we would not win anything in court. But after my lawyer sent the letter, chaos broke out in the company and all traces of the former equanimity disappeared. Their tension was palpable. They threatened bankruptcy if I talked to the media. They didn't know that I was already on the verge of financial collapse. I was facing a year behind bars. I had almost no savings and vague prospects for the future. Strangely enough, difficult circumstances have made me immune to the fear of bankruptcy. When my lawyer contacted them again, he emphasized the seriousness of my situation by offering to take up the case for free because of the blatant injustice my unfortunate husband had been subjected to. They asked for a face-to-face -face meeting at their office. When we entered the conference room, we found ourselves face-to-face -face with Randolph Wiseman. When I sat down, he couldn't help but quip, Well, well, look who's here, the little cuckold himself. I heard that you came to beg. Did you have a good time behind bars thanks to me and the district attorney? I knew you were too stupid to accept the deal he offered, he laughed. Randolph, I asked you not to talk to me in that tone. Now you've earned yourself another trip to the cheerleader doctor. At this point, William Wiseman, another descendant of the company's founder, intervened in the conversation. Come on, Randolph, stop playing the tough guy. We are trying to find a solution not to aggravate the situation. So, if you can't keep quiet, you'd better let others deal with it. Feeling a little hurt by his partner's criticism, Randolph meekly replied, Okay, William, I understand. We've known each other for a long time, that's why we're here. Let's hear them out. My lawyer Giles intervened in the conversation. Gentlemen, our goal, as stated in our letter, is simple. We intend to file a claim for alienation of affection. 
Although some may consider this a minor issue with little chance of success, we believe otherwise. This is a rare chance for us to gain significant notoriety for your law firm with the help of an enterprising journalist. But the story of Mr. Jacob's betrayal and imprisonment, which was made possible by the connections between a partner of this firm and the prosecutor, may not match the type of attention you are looking for. This is an attempt to hold our firm accountable, said Howard Green, senior partner and eldest son of Arnold Green, one of the firm's founders. My client has suffered the loss of his wife and a year in prison because of the actions of your partner, Randolph Wiseman. If it hadn't been for Wiseman's inappropriate behavior, my client would have been happily married, working, and free. The damage caused by this firm to my client is significant, and if a lawsuit does not solve the problem, we will consider other options. I must inform you that the ex-wife of my journalist colleague worked for this company. Can you guess which partner she obeyed? He is very interested in ruining your reputation in the eyes of the public. He will do it without hesitation. As for the others, I urge you to consider whether it is really in your best interest to contact him, especially if you disapprove of his behavior, as Wiseman does. Suddenly, Peter Cooper, who had been silent until that moment, let out an unexpected scream. Indeed, he said, giving Wiseman a scornful look, as if he were an annoying speck on his shoe. Giles continued his speech by stating that although we consider a million to be an insufficient amount, it is quite an acceptable amount to solve the current issue for the company. And again, Peter Cooper interrupted him. We will inform you of our decision by the end of the day. Good afternoon, Mr. Jacobs. I apologize for the inconvenience caused by this person. He left the room in a state of obvious disappointment. It soon became clear that the partners were not only ready to pay compensation, but also decided to buy out Wiseman's share at a significantly reduced price, effectively excluding him from the list of partners. They needed my signature to officially confirm the full settlement of the dispute with their firm and prevent any claims in the future. Now another part of my struggle has been resolved, allowing me to focus on other priorities. My main goal to get back at Wiseman didn't need legal help, just my own determination and a bit of savvy. I started getting to know Wiseman's wife. She was a regular customer of the gym, going there four times a week to keep a slim figure despite having three children. Although she was a little fuller in the hips than before, she was still amazingly beautiful, and I wondered why someone like her was not enough for the sages. After observing her daily routine for two weeks, I noticed a curious pattern. I noticed that she was visiting the house of a man who was ten years younger than her. One Wednesday, I decided to approach her as she was leaving his house. Mrs. Wiseman, can we talk? I caught up with her as she was walking to her car. I'm sorry, I'm in a hurry, she replied. Does your husband know about your Wednesday meetings, Mrs. Wiseman? My question caught her off guard, revealing their shared secret. When she paused, I wondered if there wasn't something more to this story. Okay, what do you need? She finally asked. Just a chat, Mrs. Wiseman. Let me buy you a coffee at the cafe across the street. This is a safe public place and I promise I won't hurt you. We found empty seats, and I started the conversation by asking if she remembered her husband returning home with an injury more than a year ago. He had a dislocated shoulder and several fractures. She confirmed that she remembers. Then, I confessed that I was the cause of these injuries. I explained that I had caught him in bed with my wife, and when I confronted him, he tried to discredit me. So I took matters into my own hands. Did he mention that he is no longer a partner of his company? She shook her head. I approach this issue too subtly. Now I'm looking for ways to get him into even more trouble. Mrs. Wiseman, I suppose you know that your husband has behaved in this way before. Yes, it was typical of our whole marriage. Lately, as you've noticed, I've been having extramarital affairs too. One of them is Ryan, whom I visited this morning. Smiling softly, she looked at me and said, I don't want to offend you, Mr. Jacobs, but I can't help but wonder what your wife was thinking when she claimed Randy was great in bed. Maybe she was crazy, or maybe he charmed her. He's very good at it, but not in bed. 
My ex-wife couldn't give me a good reason either. She just blames herself for betraying me so easily. She is very remorseful. Do you live in prosperity? So put up with his infidelity and seek solace elsewhere? I asked, with a note of disappointment in my voice. Mrs. Wiseman seemed to catch my train of thought. I see what you're getting at, Mr. Jacobs. Did you really expect to find a faithful wife who would be shocked by her husband's infidelity? Perhaps you were hoping for a divorce, she said, acknowledging my motives. I'm very sorry to disappoint you, Mr. Jacobs. Over the past eight years, I've experienced the most intense intimacy of my life. Of course, not with my husband. It's really incredible. I wish we could meet more than once a week, but I have to be careful not to be discovered. I'm trying to be circumspect, but it seems I'm not being circumspect enough since you figured it out so quickly. You have to understand that I love Randy. I once loved him deeply, but his infidelity extinguished that love. Having children complicates the situation, Mr. Jacobs. I don't suppose you had any children together? Regardless, in our relationship, only I have the financial resources. I have a substantial trust fund that I inherited from my grandfather. If we ever break up, I may have to pay him alimony, although I'm not sure about that. Perhaps these funds are protected. The thought of divorce never crossed my mind because of our children. For their sake, I keep Randy with me because he's a good father, despite his flaws. Mr. Jacobs, although I try to be careful, it seems to me that Randy may know about my relationships with other men. It happens that on Wednesday evening I do not have time to clean up after meeting with Ryan. I have a feeling he knows. Despite his confidence in his ability to make other men cuckolds like you, I believe he can just pretend. Smiling, she added, I would prefer to have my needs met more often than once a week. Are you ready to reciprocate the intimacy? I will be glad to help you in carrying out revenge. Are you free on Friday mornings? The morning suits me the most because in the afternoon I have to pick up the children from school. I've accepted that Wiseman won't get divorced in the future, but maybe I should consider sleeping with his wife as revenge. It is said that revenge is a dish that is best served cold. My name is Esther, Mr. Jacobs. If we're going to have a secret relationship, it would be nice if I knew your name too. My name is Ron, Esther, and I can't wait for Friday. I know where you live, so why don't I come over at 10? The children will probably be at school by now. She nodded in agreement. She wasn't what I expected, but she was an amazing woman. I couldn't resist her charm. Since I found my wife with her husband, I have not had a close relationship with anyone. It seemed to me that this was the right decision. We ended the conversation by promising to meet on Friday. Although it was not what I expected, I waited with interest for the end of the period of silence. The idea that, as retribution, I would seek solace in Wiseman's wife, despite her lack of physical beauty, was very attractive. I couldn't wait to get to know her better. I had no idea how much joy it would bring me. That Friday morning, we unexpectedly had a great time together, and then we lay side by side, hugging, as if confirming the reality of our shared experience. I quickly realized that there was a deeper connection between us than just physical attraction. At first, we had light conversations, but then she brought up the topic that our spouses might trade us for each other. She complimented me by calling me handsome, and in response I expressed my bewilderment why her husband would look for someone else if such an amazing wife was waiting for him at home. Four Fridays in a row we met in the same way, until one fateful day came. She kissed me gently on the cheek before saying those terrible words, Ron, we need to talk. When she kissed me with special passion, hoping to relieve the tension, I couldn't get rid of the feeling that she was going to break up with me. Ron, I've already said that I'm from the rich. I have a trust fund, and I have a suspicion that this is why Randy married me. I represented a strikingly attractive life partner and, more importantly, a source of financial stability. What I didn't know was the extent of this wealth. My grandfather was a real fraud, having made a fortune beyond any imagination and exceeding all imaginable limits of expenditure. 
and if anyone could squander this wealth, it's his only heir, my father. My grandfather did not believe in his father's ability to manage money wisely, so he gave him a monthly allowance for comfort, not for embezzlement. The rest of the money was placed in a trust fund for me, which I will be able to access when I turn 38 years old. I do not know why this figure was chosen as the age for access, but this deadline is approaching in just eight months. After spending time with you on our first Friday together, I felt the need to learn more about my trust fund, in particular about the divorce. He's completely safe. Randy doesn't have any rights to him. I brought it into the marriage and none of us replenished it. It has remained virtually untouched, with the ability to withdraw a small amount each year. My financial advisor advises me to follow certain rules to ensure the inviolability of the deposit, which, in his opinion, is very important, although in general he is confident in its safety. It makes me wonder, do I really need Randy in my life? I wonder if I can allow him an unlimited number of visits to children, which will be determined by us. I began to realize that I had come to terms with Randy and no longer loved him. Why should I stay with a man who was constantly cheating on me? I know it may seem duplicitous, but he cheated on me before I cheated on him. Ron, I'm not asking you to take Randy's place. I want to say that I have feelings for you. I want to see you as often as we both want, and I believe that we could become more than just casual partners. I'm ready to leave Ryan if you're ready to be with me. Esther, this is probably the most important conversation of our lives. I was waiting for you to express your gratitude and say goodbye. I fully support your proposal. Like you, I initially saw it as a way to get revenge, but now I see that it is developing into something deeper. We continued to meet on Fridays until we had discussed everything thoroughly. She told me that she met with Ryan on Wednesday, but only to say goodbye. Ron, I've come up with an insidious but intriguing plan. Let me reveal my plan which I plan to surprise Randy with next Friday morning. When she shared her idea, a big smile spread across my face. She was a genius. I liked it. The following Friday came, and Esther and I were completely immersed in our usual Friday morning adventure. By this point, our desire for each other seemed unquenchable. We didn't know yet that a man named William Fox, dressed in a shabby business suit, was quietly sitting in the living room downstairs and going about his business. Suddenly, we heard a voice exclaiming, Who the hell are you? What are you doing here? Where is Esther? It was Randy, whom Esther had summoned to a midday meeting of the utmost importance. Despite his insistent requests for more information, she insisted that it was very important and urged him to come. Are you Mr. Randolph Wiseman, sir? Your wife said you were coming. A voice rang out as Randy approached. She's upstairs with her escort if you want to join them. Randy's voice echoed through the room, causing us to interrupt the conversation. Esther was looking forward to his arrival, and I was distracted, lost in my own thoughts. Esther took the initiative. Come on, Ron, show me what you're made of. You are superior to my husband in every way, she exclaimed, exaggerating to convince me. Randy, darling, you look upset. Relax. I'm just having a little fun on the side, just like you. With that, I turned around, giving Randy a chance to see who was in bed with his wife. The cuckold himself? You must be joking, he exclaimed. Why did you bring this clumsy man into our bedroom? Get rid of him before I lose my temper. I got out of bed and walked over to him. Well, what do you think of my answer? And when it comes to threats... Do you really consider yourself that powerful? Remember, I promised you a trip to the doctor. He looked scared, but I calmed him down. Don't worry, we have something else for you. There's a surprise waiting for you under the pillow. Why don't you take a look? I led him to the bed, and when he reached under the pillow, he took out an envelope. Esther and I said with one voice, You have been served. William Fox, who followed us upstairs, quickly took a picture of us and noticed, It's official. We did everything perfectly. Randolph froze in disbelief, looking as shocked as when I dislocated his shoulder once. Esther gave Randy a light slap in the face to bring him back to reality, 
and then explained that what he was experiencing was just retribution for his actions against me. She openly stated that she no longer loved him because of his infidelity during their marriage, and her feelings turned into sincere neglect. She assured him that she would not come between him and their children, promising him full access to them. She offered him the services of a lawyer if he wanted, believing that for the sake of the children they would be able to resolve the issue of divorce peacefully without turning it into a fierce struggle. Randy remained calm, nodding in agreement with her words. Despite his unpleasant personality, he was not a fool. He understood that his marriage had come to an end and that fighting it would only be a waste of time and resources. Standing in silence, I watched his world crumble. My initial goal was achieved. I successfully divorced Carly, and under the guidance of my mother, I managed to do it with grace and dignity. Realizing her mistake, she took responsibility for the subsequent fall and offered a sincere apology. The mother's warnings turned out to be correct. I managed to get a significant amount from Carly's employers, and with Esther's help, I successfully turned over Wiseman's script, eventually taught him a lesson. The manipulator was deceived, and I played my part in destroying his marriage. Moreover, perhaps I fulfilled Carly's wish when she said, Don't let my mistakes dictate your future. Find the one who really deserves you. Create a family. Find happiness together. Make your parents proud of you and live your life to the fullest. Despite Carly's mistakes, her wise words resonated with me even in the darkest moments of her life. After going through all this, I realized that karma exists. I broke up with Carly without hatred. I did not take revenge on her, but no matter how it was, karma befell her. She was recently caught with a man in his bed. The wife of the cheater caused great harm to Carla. The offended spouse was furious when she saw her husband with another woman in the marital bed and poured boiling water from the kettle over the cheaters. As a result, the cheaters were taken to the hospital with severe burns. Now Carly is not as beautiful as she was before. Her face is badly damaged. She probably thought about her actions.